Hello, my friends and fellow fans, wherever you may be and however you may be watching. Thank you so much for giving us just a little bit of your time. And have you ever wondered what it would be like? Thank you very much. Another technical way to start the show. I haven't done that in a while. But uh, yeah, have you ever wondered what it would be like to see a, what, 1,700 pound grizzly bear get jacked up on cocaine? Elizabeth Banks had the answer to that question for you <laughs> in a in a very entertaining romp that was loosely based on a true story. We'll go into that later on in the, in, uh, in the review. But uh, yeah, we're here to break down Cocaine Bear for you guys, uh, along with uh, most of the uh, most of the usual co-hosts of the show. The first of which, obviously, is the Dowager Countess Lady Cora. How are you tonight, ma'am? I'm great. I loved watching the movie. It was a wonderful thing to do with my Saturday, and I'm happy to talk about it. Yeah, this movie was a lot of fun. I, this this movie delivered on all the fun that the trailer promised. It actually was kind of one of the perfect, perfectly, perfectly marketed films for what it was, I think. And then, of course, also our resident, one of our resident horror experts, of the shape from the Lone Star State, our man Tex. What's up, brother? You know, we really should listen to Bob Barker here and keep your cocaine bear spayed or neutered. And we'll be better <laughs> off. We wouldn't have half the problems that they did in this film if it was just spayed or neutered. So keep that in mind, people. The responsibility is on you. Well, it turns out that, well, in real life, it didn't matter much, but for the sake of the movie, you're going to say that. <laughs> but look, I mean, uh, yeah, we're, uh, you guys know what we're here to talk about. We're going to talk about Cocaine Bear. This is one that we were really, really looking forward to the moment that we saw the trailer. Yeah, yeah. Like I said, it did not disappoint. Uh, Cocaine Bear, released as Crazy Bear in some countries. That was the title in other countries. Is a 2023 American horror comedy film directed by Elizabeth Banks. It is loosely inspired by the true story of the cocaine bear, an American black bear that ingested nearly 75 pounds of lost cocaine. Let's well, think it for a second. 75 pounds of lost cocaine. Uh, this film stars Karen yeah. Russell, O'Shea Jackson Jr., uh, Kristen Coventry, Alden Eidenreich, uh, uh, Margot Martindale. I almost called her Wink Martindale. Sorry, that's how old I am for that. You guys will get that reference. And, uh, the, of course, the late, great Ray Liotta. Uh, the film was dedicated to Liotta, who passed away just before it, uh, it hit theaters in, in May of 2022. Uh, Cocaine Bear was uh, released, uh, actually, in February of 2024, February 24th of 2023, Um it received kind of lukewarm reviews from uh, critics, but it has grossed uh, eighty-seven million dollars worldwide uh, against a budget estimated to be about thirty or thirty-five million dollars. Uh, as far as what uh, some of the critical response was, uh, we'll see. Rotten Tomatoes it's got a sixty-eight percent, which isn't terrible from about three hundred critics. Those are positive reviews. An average rating of six point one out of ten. That's not terrible. Uh, Metacritic, which uses a weighted average, assigned the film a score of fifty-four out of hundred, which is not not too much different based on a fifty-eight critics. Uh, most of the uh, reviews that I've read are kind of what I expected. It's uh, one girl from uh, the Chicago Sun-Times, I'm sorry, Richard Roper of the Chicago Sun-Times said, wildly entertaining and darkly hilarious B-movie blood fest, genuinely well-crafted horror. Uh, and the same uh, in, uh, was it, Real Views, uh, James Bardinelli called it 95 minutes of escapist fare. Though he criticized a number of characters, subplots, and pacing, he concluded the film was silly but not stupid. Uh other reviews said that, uh, let's see, it was not profound, but it was an incredible blast, especially if you have the benefit of seeing uh, director Elizabeth Banks' insanely violent comedy thriller with a packed crowd. It was a lot better to watch the crowd. It got a lot of funny, uh, a lot of funny reactions when I saw it. Uh, <clears throat> but yeah, and the, and the uh, negative reviews weren't really bad. I mean, they were just like, they basically said that this isn't our kind of, this isn't my kind of movie. It's kind of what what the negative reviews said, which you kind of get because it's it's a horror movie at its core, and horror movies aren't for everybody. You know, those, you know, those people are a bit soft, in my opinion, but but horror movies aren't for everybody. Look, I I thought it was I thought it was a very entertaining movie. I, I left there. I, I this was one of the movies that I had trouble leaving my expectations at the door because the trailer I, that we first got that kind of blew this entire project up was just so damn entertaining on its own. It promised us this really wild, crazy concept of. A cocaine, uh, you know, a cocaine fueled grizzly bear. I mean, grizzly bears, uh, you know, on their own in nature are pretty deadly predators. They're pretty much the apex predator on Earth, almost uh, on land, anyway. And to think that one of them did, did a couple rails of cocaine and decided to go on a on an eating binge of anybody that got in his way, it's it, it was it was probably a little bit more realistic than Sharknado, but still equally as, as outlandish. There wasn't he a black bear <laughs> in this? Uh, I think it said it said I don't know. Well, Wikipedia said grizzly bear. 
I'm sorry, well, black bear. American, American black bear. In reality, it was a black yeah. bear. An American black bear. And in the movie, they even said it's a black bear. Yeah. But we'll, we'll, we'll talk about how it compares to the real life situation here in a minute. Because the real life situation, while interesting, probably not nearly as entertaining. <clears throat> but, uh, but yeah, I mean, basically, I mean, the plot of the movie is just that. I mean, there's, there's a couple of subplots to go through the movie. One of them is, of course, the... Uh, the cocaine being thrown out of the airplane by these smugglers. The other one is the family drama that kind of plays out kind of throughout the whole the whole movie, which I thought was pretty good. I like Carrie Russell. Carrie Russell's always been very entertaining. And the kids were a lot of fun to watch, too. And uh, also, there was a secondary family drama going on between Ray Liotta and his son, played by Alden Einreich, which I which wasn't really necessary, but I kind of was like, okay, I get it. You're, you're trying to raise a kid in the midst of trafficking cocaine. That's got to be a strange complication if you've uh, never done those two things at the same time. And, you know the, the really weird goofy love story between Margo Martindale and the and, and the one weird guy who comes around. I mean, there's all the little subplots, a, a little bit distracting at times, but I think they were there mostly for comedic effect rather than any serious storytelling. Uh, but yeah, so there was a lot going on around it. But I mean, the star of the show was quite clearly the bear. I mean, I'll go and I'll go to you first, Lady Cora. I mean, there, a lot, a couple of different things are happening in this. Did one of the storylines jump out at you? I mean, did you enjoy kind of how the story played out overall? I really, I think that <laughs> the thing about Ray Liotta's character, uh, what was his name? Let me see here. Um, what's his character in a movie? What was he fucking called? Well, anyways, the, the, the thing with his son uh, his and character's his name grandfather was... impromptu, right you know. Sid. And, Sid was his name. Sid. Sid, was name of Sid and, you know, the whole thing about. The, the mother of the, of the son dying and the tattoo having the wrong name, John instead of Joan. <laughs> that jumped out at me because it was the one you, you didn't get very much background on. Sure, you saw the kid in the ball pit for a minute, you know, but you did, and, and you see the son, you know, who's really struggling with the loss of his partner. <laughs> but I don't know. I, it just was that, that was the most interesting to me because you only saw a snippet of it compared to. The family stuff with Carrie Russell's character and her daughter and stuff, you seem to know more about it, so it was less mysterious to me. Sure. Well, well how about you, Tex? Was there were you were you annoyed by by the multiple storylines? Because I you know, if you had told me going into it, I might have been like, really? But at the end of the movie, it didn't really bother me all that much. I thought the movie, despite being kind of branching off in a couple of weird moments, it it, it didn't it didn't affect me too much. Cause I mean, let's face it, this movie's almost <coughs> a spoof. <laughs> of a real life situation. Well, I mean, what, what did you think of the basic storyline, the plot? I like the film, but I mean, remember, even when I first was talking to y'all about this, I said it's it's about ten minutes, maybe even twenty minutes too long. And uh, the I like obviously the 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 cocaine is what you're here to see. The story with the kids was the heart of the film. The story with the park ranger was absolutely needed. But the one, st I'm a big fan and veteran of watching the B movie sci fi channel animal specials, you know, you know, Croc versus Gator, you know, Sharknado, whatever you may be. I've seen them all. I love them all. I'm a huge fan. And obviously, you have to have something for your human element to do. But I feel like, especially Ray Liotta's goons, I don't think we need... They didn't need the family drama as well as the missing cocaine. I feel like those characters should have been dedicated to that storyline and not both, because I think it kind of drives it off. Just It kind of veers to the left a little bit. Like there's, They try and throw too much plot at you at times in this movie, and I think that's what kind of put me off a little bit. That makes sense. Yeah, I, I agree. I I was okay with the plot of the mother and the daughter and their thing. Right. And and like I said, the park ranger and her boyfriend that she has a crush on. I mean, that, that was it was very much a subplot, something that was obviously there for just humor. But as much as I love Ray Liotta, I didn't need that father-son storyline. It, it just it, it would have. I think it would have been a little bit more streamlined if it would have just been either the it's two off. guys, uh, either the two guys, uh, Alden Einreich's character and O'Shea Jackson's character, kind of looking for it. And yeah, you can have him struggling with the loss of his wife. That's fine. But then you factor in the Ray Liotta thing, and it, it, it did kind of add a little bit too much to the movie. It didn't really need. 
Hmm. Or it could have just been Ray Liotta and his son going out there and doing this thing. And then they're kind of hashing it out as it's going on because it doesn't really, that storyline doesn't get super deep till later in the movie when I'm trying, when I'm kind of waiting for things to sum themselves up. And while I'm setting that stuff up, now I'm getting introduced to Ray Liotta into this situation in the third act. And it kind of was like, eh, it threw the pacing off a little bit for me. Not that, I mean, and, and this is me who loves almost everything Ray Liotta has ever done. But, I mean, the, the main plot of, of the, you know, cocaine-fueled bear, I mean, that speaks for itself. I, I don't think we need to examine that too much. I mean, it, it's what it is, and that's kind of one of the things that attracts us to it is we're just along for the ride on that one. Uh, Carrie Russell, uh, again, fantastic actress. I, I can't think of anything she's done that I haven't really, really liked. We were talking about before the show about the Americans. She's just about cast right. and something. Another TV show is going to be coming out kind of in <clears> vain, a little more of a political thriller kind of thing, as, as, I, as I understand it anyway. But uh, yeah, she is fantastic. Uh, I, mean, I, I I like that story. That would have been a decent of story. It would have been almost almost Goonies like. If yes. I if I maybe that's what I'm yeah. thinking. It's like because it's funny you say you know, that. Kids... I had a similar concept of this feels Goonies ish when I was watching it, but I didn't couldn't put my finger on it exactly. But yeah, it was kind of like Goonies like, only a little bit more, uh, maybe a little bit more adult there. Goonies still very much a kid yes. movie. This one maybe kind of not, but yeah, especially when you're dealing with you know 75 pounds of ingested cocaine. But right. yeah, I mean, I, I didn't have a problem with with the plot overall, but I mean, I I, I would have I could have enjoyed if they'd have pared down the stuff with Ray Liotta and his son and kind of the interaction between the three of them. O'Shea Jackson was really funny. He, he's he's a serious kind of funny, which is, sometimes works very well. It worked very well in this, in this movie. I like O'Shea Jackson Jr. He's been in a couple of things. The first big thing he did, obviously, was playing the role of his real-life father uh, in, in a Straight Outta Compton, which I think that movie is phenomenal. And he's done some things since then. It's proven he's got some acting shops. So I'm interested to see what kind of stuff he does. He was enjoyable in this movie. Kind of is like the color man to use the sports reference. Uh, you know, yeah. the one who adds a little adds a little something to the broadcast. That, that's kind of what he did. But yeah, he was very enjoyable. Alden Eidenreich, he, dude, he's a really good actor. It's really it's really unfortunate to me that whenever you say his name, most people automatically kind of snap to the, the, you know, the solo movie, which wasn't terrible, but had a lot of stuff surrounding it, you know, director changes in the middle of the shoot and not yeah, doing very well. The the from the beginning. Not being a movie that anybody really needed anyway, probably being a very poorly timed movie in the star Wars universe. Uh, people kind of snap to that, but he's, he's actually very, very good in this movie. He's again, he's, he's also kind of like a serious, comedic character it's like you you can it's i hate to say it like this but you almost laugh at his sadness it's almost funny yes. in this movie it's so what? overboard and overbearing he's just mopey the whole time like and it, it's like every time he would you know they went into that part of the story i was like oh crap more of this i just like whenever him and his buddy o'shea jackson went on the you know once they get to the national park i'll you know that's like midway through the film or whatever, and you expect it to pick up, but they're dealing with this subplot where the teenagers robbed them, and now they're going to blah, blah, blah. It's like there's always another little molehill you have to get over till you get to the to, to the meat of it. And I know why they did it for filler, but because, I mean, in these creature movies, obviously, I mean, Cocaine Bear, cocaine bear doesn't talk, so you have to have somebody to fill up your runtime. But it felt like it was, it felt like since this was a big budget, big studio film, they had to put more in it because they expected it because that's the way they do big movies. You don't Whereas think the, group I, of the teenagers brought like an element of this is why people are scared to come here to keep people on edge and the, the bear uh, just amp that up? I think the teenagers were thrown in there to try to get more of a teenage audience because without them, y'all, mm -hmm. all you have is kids or old people. That's I a, mean, that's realistically, you know, I mean, the teenagers. I liked their first part where they're stealing candy and money and the money that they paid for it from the ranger shack. But I don't know. The more they went on, the kind of like I don't know. I, I felt yeah, like I mean, once. I felt like once the stabbing in the bathroom and he beats them all down, I didn't really need to see them much anymore. That was, I was kind of done with them at that point. But yeah, it would have been given, it, um, uh, getting stabbed isn't fun. <laughs> <laughs> 
Not ever having been stabbed, I would imagine it's just not a whole lot of fun. But I agree, <laughs> I agree with what you're saying. It's like it, it would have been. It's one thing for them to have that interaction with those three right. little hooligans, but it, it just took longer than it needed to. It felt like it was a little too much filler. You know, you, you, you say that you're very astutely that you know the bear can't talk, so you have to have somebody fill it. You have to have some kind of dialogue. But part of me wonders, as you, as I hear you say that. Would this movie have gone a little bit better and a little smoother if there had been less dialogue? Because you know the bear can't talk. You know he's just all about action. Right. He's going to chase this it's guy. Sheet, and eat him. He's going to chase this girl and eat him. That that sometimes that lack of dialogue can actually add to the intensity of the scene a little bit. And, and you know you you ha- having watched almost every horror movie that's ever been made, Tex, you should you shit. you know very clearly there is there is a fear that builds in silence. Right. It's because it's because you know, it's, it's you know when Freddy when you know Freddy Krueger's there like I'm gonna get you I'm gonna stab you that's scary but right. it's like when you're walking through the the boiler room and you don't see him you don't hear him all you hear is the ambient sound or no sound there's something that amplifies the fear in that so not having a little bit of dialogue in spots I think probably would have helped build some of the tension a little bit at times. There was a moment right. for me just like that at the towards the end when they were at the falls when the the mama bears at the top. And the cubs around with them. Carrie Russell didn't have to say, "Oh no, she's mad. she's protecting her cubs." Everybody fucking knew what was going on. She heard them crying. She came. She's yeah. about to, you know, right. cut everybody. I wish maybe in that moment she wouldn't have said anything. We would have had a more of a dramatic moment of the bear coming down with silence. So I hear what you're saying. Yeah. Well, well there's two ways. Well, there's two ways to do a movie like that. Oh, go ahead, Frank. Sorry. Well, I mean, yeah, I don't like it when they feel like they have to explain to the audience what happens all the time. I mean, sometimes maybe it's necessary, but there are other times where it's like, because I mean, not that any of us know are experts on bears, but we know. I mean, we we've, we've looked at we've read stuff in school and stuff all of our lives that you know the bears protect their cubs. So all she has to do is just look down, see the cubs, then the camera pans up to see yeah. her face, and all she has to go is, "Oh shit!" And she's gonna audibly say something that we already know, so that could have moved things a lot faster too. I agree. Well, that's what I was going to say is there's two ways to do a movie like this. And I think there's prob- probably a reason why movies like this are kind of, well, these days they're put on sci-fi. But movies like this, I mean, Roger Corman, Frank, I'm sure you know that name, famous movie producer. He's had probably a dozen different production studios that he's put together. He he was known for making the cheap scary movies that got teenagers to go see him. He, he wouldn't, he literally bought a, a, an old uh, lumber yard and turned it into a movie studio in Southern California. It still looked like a lumber yard. He put no money into any of his stuff, but he made movies like this, you know, giant spider attacks earth, whatever it may be. But there's two ways to do it. You either go schlocky and funny like a Sharknado, or you keep it serious and you keep it scary, but you cut down on, unnecessary dialogue kind of take the alien approach where you don't see her as much, but you hear more and not in the way of dialogue, but you know, sounds, the ambient noise, everything else. There's a science to this. that has been figured out. And like I said, with them trying to do a big budget version of it, while I'm a fan, it could have been done better by just skimming down on the unnecessary meat that we didn't need for this meal. You know what I mean? Yeah. But yeah, but overall, I mean, it, it's a very entertaining film to be sure. Uh, oh, very so. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's a, yeah. hilarious. Yeah. yeah. You know, I, I, what, you know, this thing, this movie did something very, very well that a lot of horror movies have to get right if they're going to stand a chance. And that's the opening scene. And when you see these oh two God, hikers yeah. come across the bear in the opening <laughs> scene, like that really did set the tone for what this movie was going to be at its core. It's like, yes, it's going to be scary. Yes, it's going to be a, a cocaine-fueled bear chasing people in the woods. But it gave you the bits of comedy. It gave you the bits of tension. It didn't quite give you the blood right off the jump. I mean, you see some things, sure. Uh, it, yeah, it, you can you know, you know, the foot being thrown at you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, I mean... And it's it, it it great that the they stage. cast the guy from Game of Thrones that, you know, a lot of people love. <laughs> and the... They, right. and, and at first, I think they throw you off because with his accent and him being European, all the the, the the patches on their backpacks, you wonder where the fuck are you know you know you're in Georgia, you know. But what's going on? Why are these international people here? You know, are these going to be pivotal characters, or are they just random? You know, 
first dyers in a horror film. So I like that a bit about it. But the second she started talking about having kids, you knew she was going to die. It's like, yeah, foreshadowing. No, <laughs> no. But yeah, but yeah, that was the one thing this movie did that I I, I knew it was going to have to do to get off to a good start. It was have a really a really cool right. enticing opening scene. I think it did it. I think it set up the rest <laughs> of the movie very very well. But uh, I don't know. So some random thoughts from you, Lady Cora, about the film to go, before we go delving into some of the trivia and stuff that I about this movie. I really loved how each character had some depth to it. The Liz, the forest ranger, she had a crush on, you know, um, God, what was his name? Um, oh, his name not, is uh, what is he? Uh, Jesse Tyler Ferguson is the guy. He's from is the actor. He's yeah. from Modern Family. Peter yeah. was his name in the, in the movie. Yeah, Peter. And now, you know, I like how she had no idea that the teenagers she thought were sweet teenagers were the, actually the gang of teenagers who were cutting people up when how many groups of teenagers hang out there. You know, like, her obliviousness and her hope. I mean, she seemed really... And then when someone comes in and asks, is there a forest ranger? And all she says is, I'm wearing the things. I mean, that was one of my favorite well, lines in the whole movie. Did you not think that maybe they were kind of playing with a stereotype of, oh, you know, teenagers hang out and they do bad things with that group, especially with this being in like an 80s kind of That's theme? That's true. That's kind of how it felt. Because, I mean, you saw how hardcore and thuggish they really were when a real man stepped up into it. Yeah, <laughs> they may have stabbed that guy, but he, I mean, he handled them pretty hastily with little to no issue. So, I mean, to me, that very much felt like, oh, I want just, you know, off, you know, off my lawn, child, or whatever. It was just a very, <laughs> it was a very, like, I love the world this movie was in, but it felt like they were playing with a lot of 80s style stereotypes. I mean, hell, just look yeah. at Kerry Russell in, 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 that, in, in that jumper and tell me that they're not just, you know, you know, that, pink, you know that thing had pants. shoulder pads in it. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> hey, don't, actually, it doesn't look like they're shoulder pads, which is very odd for the '80s. Everything in the '80s had shoulder pads. But, uh, but maybe I'm, you're I'm right. Well, like, yeah. Terry Russell's hot as fuck in this movie. I'm not gonna lie. I thought she was gorgeous. Oh, I, I was <laughs> digging it. I, I wasn't hating. She's so badass. She's saving her kid on a bicycle. Like you're just gonna yeah. go on the bike, you know. And at the very end, <laughs> why the fuck didn't he give her a ride in the truck? Why are they riding a bike and walking? Well, when he's an I called. Kid? I called her April April O'Neil in pink is what she looked like in this movie. If you go back and watch the old Ninja Turtle cartoon, she wore the yellow jumpsuit. She looked at, I mean, if she if they ever wanted to do another live action Ninja Turtles, Carrie Russell could do April O'Neil, just put her in a yellow jumpsuit and she's got it down. She's, she's already played the role, so you know, it is Maybe. what it is. <laughs> but uh, Tex, what, are, what are some of your just kind of like random thoughts on the film as we get ready to go into the trivia stuff? I, I'm so happy movies like this can get made because, you know, this is bringing more acceptance to my kind of movies. The movies that you used to see in a grindhouse or a drive-in or a sci-fi channel. That's coming to the front. We're seeing films like Terrifier, Winnie the Pooh, Blood and Honey, Cocaine Bear, <coughs> that used to be straight to DVD, actually get some recognition. And I like that this is happening. And, you know, five years ago, this probably wouldn't have been on screen. But, you know, it's a – I'm glad that it was. It, it may not have been great. It was still good. And, uh, you know, I hope this leads to heroin shark or meth, methed out monkey or whatever they want to do next. I'll be there for that one, too. Well, there is apparently, from what I've heard, now there's going to be a run on these things. There is a meth crocodile thing that apparently they're trying to do. There's, I saw that even, trailer. It's that, even reinvigorated some like talk about maybe kicking up the uh, Sharknado franchise again. They're just like, oh, this is going to be the, the so. thing, and let's go ahead and throw another Sharknado movie out there and see what happens. As long as they bring, but they have to bring back Ian Ziering, Christopher Lloyd, and Terry. Those three have to come back if they do. But yeah, <laughs> true. But yeah, ultimately, I mean, the movie doesn't didn't disappoint at all. It, everything that you thought you were getting from the trailer, you got from the film, and, and so I mean, so it's it's honest and pure, great marketing. And on top of that, this movie does something that a lot of these movies tend to screw up. They try to be more than they really are. I, mean, I talk a lot about how the brilliance of things like uh, the Expendables. 
The Expendables isn't trying to be a great movie. It knows what it is. It's it's action stars. It's one line <clears throat> explosions. It's just enough story to make a movie, and that it, the brilliance is in its simplicity. Same thing with John Wick. John Wick is not fantastic storytelling, but I mean, it's great action. It's a great character that we get really involved with in the first five minutes of the first film. We get kind of emotionally attached to it because of the dog, and, and then and then it's just like it's just what it is. It's just action. It's crazy kills. It's it's one liners. I mean, these these movies don't pretend to be. High art. They just are what they are. There's beauty in their simplicity, which I think makes them really mm-hmm. enjoyable. But yeah, th- this movie didn't disappoint at all. Again, I, the music. Uh, yeah, was yeah, fantastic. the music. Well, I mean, anything based in the '80s is going to have a decent soundtrack. Come on. The <laughs> placement of the music was nice too. True. So yeah, actually, actually, one of the things I was just reading a second ago was that uh, uh, Elizabeth Banks. Uh, let's see, she got the uh, Mark Mothersbaugh. Uh, did the uh, music for this movie because she had worked with him in Pitch Perfect 2. So she was just like, hey, come do this. So it's, yeah, Pitch Perfect, very very music-based. So, I mean, he definitely pulled a lot of great uh, 80s stuff out of there to use. But, uh, yeah, again, it's just a really fun movie. Again, it, does, it doesn't disappoint. You're not going to leave, unless you are unless you are not a big fan of horror films or spoof films, or unless you're one of those really uppity people who only watches... I, I wouldn't Doctor even Jones call this films. horror, to be I honest with you. I liked it. I fall into that. I, don't, gory. I mean, I if, it, if things are tough for me to want to watch when they're extremely gory or extremely upsetting per se of, of human on human, I think it's funnier and easier to digest because it's a bear coming after them, not humans. Right. And that yeah. takes away well, some I mean, of it. But yeah, this movie was I mean, it was comedy horror. It was the comedy horror. Genre. It was. Yeah, it was. Comedy. This it, is it, like the. Third not cousin like the, uh, of the uh, horror genre, but yeah, it, I mean, realistically, if you take out the scene of the foot being thrown out of the bush when the bear attacks the chick, and the park ranger getting it, <laughs> getting her face, get, uh, turning the street into a cheese grinder, there's really not much horror. Which is the greatest scene in the movie, by the well, way. I compare yeah, it a lot. I compare it a lot to like uh, Killer Clowns from Outer Space. It's it's a comedy horror yeah. with heavy uh, much yeah. heavier emphasis on the comedy. You know, right, I mean, yeah. But uh, yeah, I, I mean, I, well, like I said, I, there was nothing about this movie that disappointed me in the least bit. I thought it was a whole lot of fun. I was really glad I got a chance to watch it in the theaters. Again, it was something that you want to watch in the crowd because the crowd that I was there with, there was, I mean, the theater went full. It was maybe about, I don't know, maybe a third full, something like that. Mm-hmm. I, I right. tend to go to movies early during the day, so I don't catch huge crowds. But I mean, everybody there had a lot of fun with it. There was, I mean, we all laughed at the same stuff. We were, I mean, a couple of the more visual kills and stuff like that definitely got so definitely got a rise out of the people i was there with it was overall it was a good movie i i have no no problems with this movie at all and i'm really glad that now it's out on home video so i can enjoy it on my living room yeah. but uh you know a little bit of the uh the trivia about the film before we get to kind of what inspires it is this was ray liotta's final completed film role before his death oh, wow. on may 26 of 2022 liotta died a week after he came to re-record his lines in post-production for this film <gasps> Elizabeth Banks said really? that praised the look of the bear once he got to look at it. <laughs> so this was his last 100% completed film role. Although he was filming the one in Louisiana when he passed away. I don't know how that movie's going to work out or not. But right. uh, let's see. Uh, you know, as far as the name of the movie is concerned, Cocaine Bear was intended to be a temporary working title. The producers decided to release it under that name because they just couldn't think of anything else. <laughs> just like, whatever. There's nothing Cocaine better. Bear. <laughs> yeah, you don't. I mean, what are you gonna, you know, a heartwarming tale of a struggling mother bear? I mean, what are you gonna call this thing? It's cocaine bear. I like yeah. give the people what, just put it out there. Here's what we're selling you, buy it or not. I mean, pretty simple. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Uh, the real cocaine bear, which has also been okay. referred to humorously as Pablo Escobar, is actually on display <laughs> not far from me in Kentucky, Lexington, Kentucky, at the Kentucky. Yeah at the Kentucky for Kentucky Fun Mall. I don't know if that's what Texas called or not. Unconfirmed rumors say it was previously owned by Waylon Jennings of all people. <laughs> the, the really? Music legend. That, that's the well, rumor. I'll, I'll, One we'll of my favorites of all time. Of, we'll go into a little bit about the background of the story of Cocaine Bear here at the, here at the end. But I, I, from what I've read about this thing, there's a couple of YouTube videos that have come out about kind of where the, the weird journey that the bear was on. I don't know how much of it is actually true. But I want it all to be true because it's because even after the bear dies, it's like doing the cocaine and just keeling over of whatever health problems you have when you eat just 75 pounds of cocaine. 
Uh, just yeah. that in and of itself is crazy. Yeah. That in and of itself is crazy. But after that, there was this whole journey that the bear went on that is actually kind of outrageous. Uh, we'll read about that here in just a second, though. But uh, right. uh, let's see. The uh, film was obviously dedicated to Ray Liotta. And like I said, this was the last thing that he completed at the filming before he passed away. Uh, the bear in the movie is a female, while the real bear in, in real life, the situation was a male. So a small difference, not that it matters a whole lot when you're talking about a, you know, a 1500 pound killing machine on cocaine, but, you know, right. but it does make sense when you add in that extra bit about the, the mama bear trying to protect the cubs. Uh, you know, Cora, you mentioned about where this film, t- where this film is based, yes. <clears throat> have the European feel. You know where this movie was filmed? Georgia. <laughs> Ireland. Yeah. Then why did it say in the credits? It, they did some filming in Georgia. I know they that. probably did some in Georgia. I mean, well, okay. because Pinewood has their big studio uh, just north of Atlanta. That's where the MCU films gotcha. all stuff in the United States. Well, Walking Dead uh, films out there. Yeah. So, they, but yeah, the film began principal photography in Ireland on August twentieth oh. of twenty twenty one. Uh, let's see. With the exception of uh, extras, very few Irish actors were actually cast in the movie. The entire it says here the entire film was made in Ireland. So they probably had some pickup shots somewhere in uh, in, in Georgia or something. But, but yeah, it says right here the entire film was, was made in Ireland, which is kind of funny. It's in Georgia, but whatever. Uh, let's see. Actually, some of the filming locations are in the same region where the TV series Vikings was filmed. That's I haven't surprising. watched really? Vikings, but I've had a lot of people say that that show is I've, actually really awesome. I bought it awesome. and I've watched like the part of the first season. Sometime I'm going to sit down and just watch it all. Um, it looks really cool. So I'm not surprised they would use similar places. And also, Game of Thrones filmed all over the world, some of it in Ireland. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, for it to be in Ireland, they really pulled off the South in the 80s or like the early 90s because, I mean, I, I was telling Core about this. Whenever I look at that world, it reminds me of growing up as a kid. Like I, I can remember, and obviously out in Texas it's a different state, but very si- very similar in a lot of ways. What the hell? Um, mm-hmm. My house is big, big sorry. But uh, somebody will deal with it, or it'll go on, on up in flames, and it'll be live on YouTube. So there you go. Mm-hmm. So, <laughs> uh, but like I said, the the world that it built, the like everything felt real. That's one thing I did appreciate the 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 care to detail and everything else. I'll be right back. I got to deal with this. I'll agree the detail was was well done. I mean, even down to on the CG on the bear's face. I mean, the markings, the face, I mean, they went to the effort to do facial expressions that I don't know if bears actually can have. Uh, It was really surprisingly the cg was great i didn't think it was cheesy i didn't go yeah that that doesn't look realistic it actually looked realistic and i visually loved it and i don't know uh, did you agree dave oh, damn it. did you agree frank <laughs> uh, I, I mean the cg was obvious but it didn't take me out of the movie because I wasn't expecting it. Like I said, this isn't high art. I wasn't expecting this to be like a big budget Marvel movie where you know everything <clears throat> looks crisp and clean. I mean, they did. They made this movie for thirty or thirty-five million dollars. It's like, and most of that probably went to the CG. <laughs> I mean, it's like, but I mean, it, it it looked good for what I I thought for what was happening in the movie. It's like this scene right here. I mean, it was obviously CG. You can even see in that picture. There's a little bit of a, a little bit of a gloss to things, or maybe there wouldn't be a gloss in real life. But that, that didn't affect me watching the movie at all. Again, because my expectations were, I, I tried to keep them as low as I could, even though, like I said, the trailers kind of blew me away. And I was really excited um, about it. I wasn't expecting this to be great. So it's like I went in there just saying, "Give me a good movie," and it gave me a good movie. It, it, it impressed me over the course of the hour and a half or two hour runtime. So, so yeah, CG not great, but it, it didn't matter for this movie. It wasn't, it wasn't that important. Cool. But uh, let's see, what was the, a couple of things real quick. Actually, you know, we were talking about the Americans earlier. Uh, Matthew Rice, who plays, uh, or Rice, I, I don't know how to pronounce it, R-H-Y-S, Matthew Rice. Right. He was I the don't husband, know either. Right? He was the husband. He was he was her husband yeah. in the Americans. Yeah. He actually plays the guy in the beginning of the movie who's uh, Andrew Thornton, who was the one who died trying to throw all the cocaine out of the airplane, and then decides to jump out with a parachute. Yeah, that was her. Hu- that was the guy who plays her husband wow. in the Americans. So 
I of thought a, when they showed his reunion. face on the gurney, I was like, okay, they got Carrie Russell, they got her, her him, who else? And then when oh, Margo no. showed up, and it was all coincidence. It wasn't. I looked it up. It wasn't anybody. Who Look at that. Put them all together. I think that is a freaking poster. That is incredible. <laughs> <laughs> How fast do you think that ambulance was going at, the, at that time for that bear to just just run and jump like that? Obviously, yes. You know, this is not realistic, but that, it, that was it's incredible. It's interesting to think about because I know that bears, even in the woods, in like the rough terrain of the woods, can be can be uh, pretty fast anyway. Yes, the, right. they're, they're generally pretty quick. Especially but, I mean trees. Yeah, but on top of that, he's hopped up on coke, <laughs> and he's and he's running right. in a straight line. He's not even trying to like navigate around trees and shrubbery and whatnot. He's just in a straight line in a road. I was like, I wonder how. I, I found myself wondering the same thing in the movie. I was like, I wonder how. I wonder what top speed that cocaine fueled bear did have in open in open terrain. Well, it, it's kind of scary to think about. The see to kind of touch on what something y'all were just talking about. The CG of the bear. I mean. It was more than good enough. Go back and watch the scene where the policeman has the cocaine on top of the gazebo and <laughs> the bear collapses on the guy that's on the ground. And he's like, oh, I, I know it's a lady bear. And they're like, how do you know? Her vagina is on my ear or whatever. It's on my head or whatever. You know? And it was like a moment of you know laughter that entered the script, you know, the movie. And mm -hmm. I mean... It didn't look cheap. It didn't like, I mean, I don't know how much they spent on the CGI work, but I was more than happy with it. I mean, even even that shot of the bear running through, jumping into a moving ambulance. Obviously, yes, this is a, something that would only happen in the world of a Sharknado or a killer clown from outer space, but it looks convincing. You know, I mean, if you can believe that a, cocaine, a bear can eat cocaine and not die almost immediately, why can't you believe this? And it's just, it, it looked well done. The, no real complaints with it. I mean, whoever did the, 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 the work behind it knew what they were doing because I mean, even the hair looked real, whether it was matted and blood or just dry, it looked good. Yeah, I see, uh, a couple more things real quick. Uh, let's see. Uh, the story is based on a book, and I have to get this book, called Bluegrass Conspiracy, a story of corruption, drugs, money, and one dead bear. <laughs> it, it takes place between the late 70s and early 80s in Kentucky and involves several prominent members of powerful Kentucky families and government. This is a true but very fictionalized account of part of that story. So, like I said, just the bear eating the cocaine and dying was, and, and dying was only a part of the story that inspired the movie. Right. The entire story itself is actually really, really amazing. Again, there's a couple of YouTube videos. If you just go Google, like YouTube search cocaine bear, there's a couple of videos that I've seen that kind of breaks it down. And they're, and they're you know, 10, 15 minute long videos. So they're not too hard to watch. But it does, uh, it does kind of explain this whole thing. And the entire story in and of itself is worth a movie to me. I mean, it, it's very, I don't know if you guys have looked into it or not, or not, but it's really, really interesting. And, you know, we'll go into it more here in just a minute. But, I mean, it's, right. it's a crazy story. I mean, can you conceive, Tex, <clears throat> that what we got in this movie is really just like an eighth of the overall story of what even led to this thing happening? <laughs> Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, like, they use news clips within this film. I don't think all of those were fake. Some of I those seem like real. they were real. The Sam Donald yeah. yeah, were real. They, like, like I said, they may have fudged some and mixed it in or whatever. I don't know. But there's a lot of there's a lot of story that they did tell, especially the true story behind it. I mean, you know, you could do a whole movie just on the Ray Liotta drug stuff, the connection to this. But obviously your selling point is the bear part because who's, a, who's heard of a bear doing drugs, whatever. So this, there was a, this was a big, you know, a big, a, a large field to choose from when to present in, in the film. And I mean, I've never been an Elizabeth Banks fan. I think, I don't think she's ever done anything I've liked, but I'm, I liked this. It wasn't the, the way she presented the story, the players that she put in it overall, like I said, besides the couple small complaints I had at the beginning of this uh, deal, 
I'm happy with it. And I'd love to hear more. I mean, obviously, we're probably not getting a cocaine bear, too, even though it was profitable. It's funny you say that. When I was researching recent articles about it, there is is a lot of interest in it. I'm not sure they'll do it, but... It, if they it did it, it would probably would. be for a smaller budget and end up on a streaming service, which is the modern day equivalent of sticking on a sci-fi channel. If I had to guess, I yeah. doubt it gets. I doubt it gets a theatrical run, and if it does, it will probably be a limited run. I mean, it didn't even break a hundred million dollars. Did what? Did you say like eighty-seven or something like that? Eighty-eight. Uh, yeah, but, eighty-three and a half or something like that. Or eighty-three, whatever it was. Like which I said, not if, bad. Oh no no no! That's a that's a respectable amount of money, but I don't see a sequel getting a theatrical deal. I see it. Oh, a Paramount Plus or a you know HBO Max or whatever. Maybe. I don't know. I think if they kept the budget under control, if they gave it another thirty thirty five million, I mean, I would imagine that with the way that this movie is going to count, I think this is going to be one of those movies that builds in popularity over time. You know what I mean? So I would imagine that. Well, I mean, well, secondary markets aren't what they used to be because now it's all streaming and not video. I mean, so there's no right. buying of deep, there's no buying of physical media. So I don't know how the secondary right. market's going to help it at all. But I mean, if this thing gets a right. good amount of popularity and it maintains kind of that word of mouth, I can see them saying, you know, we'll spend 30, 30, we'll spend the same amount, 30, 35 million on making something well, that is at least a spiritual sequel since we can't have a straight sequel. You know what I mean? Kind of how you judge, well, kind of how I judge stuff like this is how, how, how many products come out of this? Obviously, there's a Cocaine Bear Funko Pop. You know, I, I, me and Jeremy were talking about those whenever they're announced. There's the regular one, and then there's the Chase one, which I, I want both of them, by the way. Uh, mm-hmm. They had a t shirt, and that was really about it. I would have thought somebody would have jumped on, you know, an action figure or a something else of the sort. I haven't seen anything else in Hot Topic or whatever, because, you know, those are the places that kind of pick up on stuff like this. I mean, hell, I got Sharknado merch from Hot Topic and Spencer's back in the day. I probably still got it. And, you know, it's a, I would, I would be happy to see another one, but if I'm, if I'm making another one, obviously they don't mind bending the truth to tell a good story. I think you have to do that even further. Maybe there's more cocaine that they didn't find. And there's a, you know, a family retreat or like a school, you know, like some kind of big, some kind of big activity activity that's taking place in that national park. Like a summer camp or something. A a summer camp. Pretty much take a Friday the 13th movie Take Jason out, put in cocaine bear. Do something similar of the sort. Hey, since like it, since we're in the vein of the '80s, that could actually fit. But yeah. you know, I think that could work for sequel wise. And I mean, like I said, obviously that they don't mean they don't mind playing fast and loose with the truth here, because as long as it's one percent inspired by, you can say based on a true story. That's all anything ever is. I mean, hell, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre happened in what? North Dakota or Minnesota or whatever, and it was Ed Gein. You know what I mean? Yeah, so, yeah Ed Gein was in. Actually, I think it was in. Uh, it was up north. Was it? What, no, it, 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 no, it was Wisconsin. It was Wisconsin, 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 yeah. Wisconsin. Yeah, Wisconsin. Yeah, it was Wisconsin. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. So the Texas, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre happened in Wisconsin, but it was based on a true story. It is what it is. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah, but you know, and. Obviously, I mean, the story that this thing is all based around, I mean, I'm, I'm now granted this is Wikipedia, so take it with a grain of salt because there's some things in here that I'm sure right. left out are probably not true. But uh, it says here, and this is the basic, this is the basics of the story. Uh, this bear was a 175 pound American black bear. It's fatally overdosed on cocaine in 1985. Uh, it was dropped by smugglers. The bear was found dead in northern Georgia and was stuffed and displayed at, the mall in, at a mall in Kentucky. And inspired the film. So here, here's the, uh, I'll read what it says here about the history of this thing. So on September 11th, 1985, former Lexington Police Department narcotics officer turned drug smuggler Andrew C. Thornton II was trapped in cocaine from Columbia into the United States. After dropping off a shipment in, in Blairsville, Georgia, Thornton and an accomplice departed in a self piloted Cessna 404 Titan. En route, the duo dropped a load of 40 plastic containers of cocaine into the wilderness before abandoning the plane above Mo- Knoxville, Tennessee. Thornton was killed instantly when his parachute failed to open, according to the FBI. Thornton dumped his cargo because the load of two men, in addition to the cocaine, was too heavy for the plane to carry. 
On December 23rd, the Georgia Bureau of Investigation reported finding a dead black bear that had eaten a large amount of, of the cocaine from the jettison containers. The containers held, had held about 75 pounds of cocaine valued at then $20 million, $20 million adjusted for inflation to $55.6 million. And by the time the scene was studied by government authorities, all of the containers had been ripped open with their contents scattered. The chief medical examiner from the Georgia State Crime Lab, Dr. Kenneth Alonzo, stated that the bear's stomach was literally packed to the brim with cocaine, <laughs> although <laughs> he estimated the bear had only absorbed three to four grams into its bloodstream at the time of its death, which is wow. interesting to me, like physically, because three or four grams out of 75 pounds of cocaine is not a lot. Right. But I mean, to a bear, I mean, I, I don't know. I don't know a bear's you know, anatomy that well, it's blood, the way it all physically it works internally, but it's like three to four grams. I mean, the bear might not be built for that kind of stuff. So, I, so maybe three to four grams is all it took. Uh, Dr. Alonzo did not want to waste the body of the bear. So he had it taxidermied and gave it to the Chattahoochee River National Recreation Area. The bear, however, disappeared until it emerged again in a pawn shop. Now in between here is where I read some other stuff. I'll get to that in a second. Eventually, it made its way to the Kentucky for Kentucky Fun Mall in Lexington, Kentucky, where it remains to this day. It has been alleged that the bear kept in Lexington is not the same bear that died in Georgia, but rather another unrelated bear due to the fact that the original bear was in a state of decomposition, although the mall maintains the bear as the original. Now, Tex, you may know more about this than me. I, I know a little bit about taxidermy. There are ways of taxidermying an animal. And, and saving the hide after some decomposition has happened. I don't probably oh, yeah. know how they happen. A, a, a buddy of mine in high school, that's what his dad did on the side was he did taxidermy. He had a whole thing, oh, yeah. a whole set up in his back. He owned a lot of land out kind of in the woods near where we lived. And he would taxidermy deer and stuff like that. So I know oh, there's yeah. ways that you can do it. I don't know if those ways existed back in the mid eighties. I don't know. Well, I've got a, I've got a deer head on my wall in the living room that was taxidermy 30 something years ago from my grandpa. It still looks brand new. I mean, I don't know the science behind it, but I've had multiple things taxidermy that I've hunted over the years. So now, I mean, yeah, there's there's ways to do it. Something that I had heard about this bear, and this happens after in the area where it says this bear disappeared. It said they gave it to the Chattahoochee National River National Recreation Area. The bear had disappeared until it emerged again in a pawn shop. Here's what I had heard. I had heard on in a video, and again, this could be 100% bullshit, but this is a really cool story, and I really want to believe it, that some guy in Japan or something like that or some one of the Asian countries had bought the bear for a significant amount of money, not millions, but a, a, a rich Asian guy bought the bear because mm -hmm. he thought it was cool. Right. And upon the guy's death, his wife just basically got rid of it because she never liked it anyway. So she was like, well, I don't need to keep right. this thing around anymore because my husband's dead. So mm -hmm. here, somebody give me 500 bucks for this thing and you can have it. And it somehow, through a couple of different owners, worked its way back to the U.S. and ended up somehow in this pawn shop where somebody somehow identified it and said, hey, this is the cocaine bear. And... I would now I would watch a movie point. just based off of that story alone. Like I said, the, here. we are getting a slice of this entire story. Yeah, and the the other the story as a whole, like like that could, to me could work as a sequel. I mean, give me like yeah, either make me a legit documentary about cocaine bear or make a movie about this crazy thing, like the guy throwing right. a coke out the bear eating it and dying, and then just follow the bear. I mean, you right. can have you can have a bunch of weird. I mean, look, you want some diversity? Have some Asian characters in there. That's great. Yeah, <laughs> it no, satisfies man. your diversity, Hollywood, because that story would be fantastic just to watch it play out in front of my eyes on the screen. I think that would be yeah. very that'd be very interesting to see. I mean, the opening scene of that movie could be, you know, the Japanese man dying, and you know, you see, you know, a few days later or something, and then his wife selling it and then carting it off in in a in a u-haul truck or something you know what i mean and then that's how you start your movie and then you know the whole opening credit is you know the sale of the bear and it being boxed up and shipped to america i can see it already that's not a hard movie to make that the idea was of it being owned by that's Warner interesting Warner is funny as hell too. <laughs> oh my god yes i mean that sounds, Jenny, exactly like, that sounds like exactly the kind of things that whaylon jenny would have spent ten oh on. no like, well, that's the bear uh, that did cocaine in the 80s hell yeah i'm spending i'm, 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 I'm jennings he's <laughs> A top three country artist for me all time. I I grew up on his music, him and Will and Nelson. That was that was you know just incredible music. I didn't know he owned this bear. I'm 
I think it's awesome that he did. And, you know, if, if they ever do make this movie, they need to get his son Shooter Jennings to play him because he looks very similar to him at that time period now. So, uh, which he's also a country artist as well. But, uh, yeah, no, like, make me that movie. Make me the how it got to where it is. You could start the movie, like I said, either start it with the, with the Asian man or you start by sh- a, a, a tour guide in the museum in Kentucky telling the story, and then, you know, that's the framing device or something. That would be a fun movie as well. I could say that. That'd be interesting. And then, of course, to start to wrap this up, there is one little thing about the bear that you guys may not know. I don't know if either one of you guys plan on getting married, but this bear can marry you. What? (laughs) According to the bear's owners, the cocaine bear has the authority to officiate legally binding weddings in the mall where it is kept due to Kentucky's marriage laws. The claim is only partially true. The bear does not have the authority to solemnize, and if you read that too fast, it sounds like something else, to solemnize weddings. (laughs) Don't mistake that one. (laughs) But the state of Kentucky cannot invalidate marriages performed by unqualified persons if the parties believe that the person marrying them has the authority to do so. As wow. such, it is a belief in the co- it is a belief in the cocaine bear's authority that allows it to officiate legally binding weddings in Kentucky. <laughs> now, how much blow do you have to be on to believe that story? Seventy-five That's pounds worth, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> now, it's like, do you seal the the nuptials by doing a line off of the cocaine bear? Because wow. that would be yeah, interesting as well. You know what I mean? I, that, I that, know. That's. <laughs> that's, that's oh, <laughs> I need to go to Kentucky just to see this bear, whether it's the real one or not. I, it, I'm going to believe it is just, just for my own, you know, stories worth that I tell my grandkids about. Oh, well, when I was your age, I got to see cocaine bear. He was 15 <laughs> feet tall or whatever, you know, my old man story. <laughs> but oh, there's so yeah, <laughs> that's the thing with stuff like this is. There's so much legends that get added to it that never happened that make perfect sense if you believe every bit of it and nobody questions mm-hmm. it. It's one of those kind of stories. It's it's something that you would see in like a National Enquirer magazine, but it's just believable enough so it gets you know it stays around through the years. You know what I mean? I think one of the reasons that stories like this persist and kind of grow more and more outlandish over time is because. It, it's so wild and so hilarious. You right. don't want to believe it. So, right. so you will, so you will take that desire to believe it with you and it turns into real belief so that when you're telling the story to somebody else, they want to yeah. believe it. And then it just over time, it just becomes like its own entity. You know what I mean? Right. Oh yeah. No, that, I mean, the, the, this, I mean, I could see a couple good old boys in Georgia. Oh, I remember seeing that cocaine bear, you know, they're sitting around the campfire having a cold one, you know, sharing stories back and forth. And like, you know, he goes and tells his buddy, and you know, it, just, it grows naturally. I mean, because I mean, it, this is a, this story, this movie, you got so many non gore fans. I mean, I, I mean, and, and don't get, don't, don't forget. There's a lot of gore in this film. I mean, from the slashing in that park ranger's office mm-hmm. to the, the, the opening hiker chick getting her, Leg bit off and flung at you throughout the screen. There's the some pretty good up, gore. The close up yeah. of the park ranger as she's getting her face rammed down the, the yeah. Highway. It's like, that looks like now, something out of a, And for those of you who you have, can hear her skin scraping on the yes. pavement. Yeah, and she's not even screaming. She's just like, <laughs> right. she can't. She's strapped to this gurney, so she can't do anything about it. But and you know, I know, uh, you know, Anani's in the chat saying he's kind of he's watching it as where he's listening to us. And then at the end, the when the kid walks by, I don't want to look, but I want to look. I don't want to look. I don't want to look. <laughs> I just like that scene. Oh boy. That scene where the park ranger comes flying out, you could have put that in a Final Destination movie, and it would have been terrifying. Like you could you could edit that into another movie and have it work. But you laugh here, I, right? Yeah, but in the fight, like just change the music behind that, and you're you know that that's your you know worst nightmare. But I mean, they had the horror, but they also had the comedy. How fun were those kids? I mean, that's that little boy, thing. that little boy. I don't know his name, but he needs more work. He was absolutely hilarious. Whenever they're asking Carrie Russell, well, how long does 
cocaine last? Like they're trying not to get caught and mm-hmm. Carrie Russell already knows. And I mean, just, just that scene of cocaine bear sneezing cocaine in their faces. I'm, I have YouTube that scene probably four or five hey, times since I, I watched it. I was watching it. it today for the first time. I was screaming oh my at God. my TV, not the kids, don't kill the yeah. kids. Yeah, oh, the well, that's what's so funny is, <laughs> you know, I mean, these kids are getting blow shot in their face and you laugh at it. But the, the way that it's structured is hilarious. Well, they you know, open that scene great, though, when you see the bear grabbing the carrots. All, and all you see right. is the bear's hand. Well, and you're like, uh-oh. If I had made this movie, I would have I, I would have gone even darker with it and like in, in like a post credit scene, do like an update to an unsolved mysteries type thing, and had like the boy be a cocaine head and he was a hardened thug and criminal because cocaine bears needs blow in his face. I would have done something along those lines or something. Can I ask but, you guys a question about something really quick? Sure. Why is it the kid said to her mom, Carrie Russell, "Oh, the bear took her." How did he fucking take her? Why is she not dead? Why was she in a cave with just an injury in her leg? How did she get so far from That was him? plot device, I think. Yeah. I mean, just to further the story. You know what I'm saying? Back. That felt weird to me. Right. You never explained how she... I don't know. Well, that, that, that kid's been around. His name is Christian C- C- Convery. Convery. He's in that show Sweet Tooth that's on. I, I, don't, I don't remember what... It's on one of the stories. I it's that. popular. I haven't watched it. He did a voice in Diary. I mean, Cocaine Bear, obviously. He was in Diary. He did the voice for the Diary of a Wimpy Kid animated stuff. He was in Descendants, which my stepdaughter watches that I never have. He had a small, uncredited role in, in the first Venom film as an eight year old boy. So he's been in that. But yeah, it's. Yeah, he, so yeah he's, he's already been in a couple of things. He he was great. That The little boy in this movie, that. He, besides the park ranger, he was my favorite role. Uh-huh. And I, I mean, he was just so, just outrageous, like childish. And like, you know, he's climbing the tree and then the, the Jesse Tyler Ferguson is climbing the other tree and the cocaine bears jumping from in between him like he's Spider-Man or something. <laughs> and it's just, it's like, Oh, how can you not enjoy this? This is, this was for as much lore and, there's a lot of meat to chew on if you want to look into this, obviously. Oh, nice, mean, we, nice pun. We, oh, yeah, I didn't know you like that. <laughs> um, you know, this is, th- with this movie, you can either just shut your brain off, slam popcorn into your face and enjoy it, or, hey, you know, you can actually look into it and make it even better. So mm-hmm. that's, this movie kind of serves a, a few different masters. And I think that's why it was so successful because gore hounds like me want to go see bears eat people that are so high on cocaine. They can't even touch the crowd. But you know, then you have people that want to dig into the history and the lore and there's something to it. You know? Good point. I did ask you guys uh, in the poll, what you guys thought of cocaine bear. I didn't know if all of you out there had seen it yet or not. I'll go ahead and close the poll now. Right. But it's pretty resounding <laughs> where it's at. Uh, seven votes. It's a pretty good all but one of you that you enjoyed cocaine there. So, yeah, I enjoyed the hell of it myself. I thought it was fantastic. Uh, I think we should start to go ahead and wrap things up now. Uh, I don't know. Text any random thoughts as we uh, as we start to get out of here. Like I said, I'm happy films like this get made, you know, from your terrifiers to the Winnie the Poos to cocaine bears to who knows what. Co- I mean, these, the, the, I think this film is going to expose a lot of people to a world of films they may not even recognize or know about. And these are, like I said, the grindhouse films, the the drive-ins, the direct-to-DVDs, the whatever you want to call them, that they get looked down upon. You know, they've been made fun of. But now that it's been brought to the mainstream light, I hope they get some relevancy. And, you know, I hope big-name talent takes a chance on movies like these because we've seen how successful they can be. I mean, look what, I mean, this 80 something million dollars off of a cocaine bear. Who would have ever thought that, <laughs> you know, I mean, normally this would have been sold to sci-fi channel for 15 bucks and, you know, a six pack or something. So I keep supporting films like this because for movie fans such as myself, I mean, it's, it's it's rare that my gore horror tastes line up with something that Cora would enjoy oh, with a I complete know. different 
with a complete favorite. different taste in film. Percent. This is a special movie. That is it perfect? No. I like I said, I cut about twenty minutes out of it. But it was still fun. So go check it out. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Cora, how about you? Any final thoughts on the film? I'll say this. I hope I'm never in a situation where I have to look at my friends and say, I have your fingers in my pocket. <laughs> Just get a full big confidence. gulp full of ice and rush to the yeah, doctor. That's all you need to do. Full yeah, confidence. I never want that to happen. Just saying. <laughs> I love my friends. But we're not going to do that. You never know. Yeah, I, I personally, like I said, it was a fun movie. I mean, I can sit here and pick it apart and overanalyze parts of it, and I would probably be right in all my criticisms. But, I mean, just turn your – sometimes you just go to the movies, you turn your brain off, you stuff your face full of popcorn, and you guzzle down your, your ice cold right. cups of your Coke, and you just let a movie have fun with your brain. And that, that's all this movie is. And, yeah, it's a really reimagined, really loosely based on a real thing. And maybe the real story, if you really play it all out from the start to its finish, it's probably a little bit more interesting. But, I mean, just taking this one little piece of it and turning into this fantastical piece of cinema, it, it's fun. It's fun. It, 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 it is a good horror movie for people who aren't into, like, the really hardcore stuff like me and Texan are, like The Exorcist right. or some shit like that. If you're into that kind of thing, but you want to dip into the uh, into the, uh, the grocery store, you want to see yeah, you want to see some people get killed, you want to see some, you want to see a few grotesque things happen. I mean, it's, look, it's not every movie. Look, well, the scene in the in the uh, Ranger's cabin, I mean, that was something straight out of a lot of horror movies. There's blood all over the place. Yeah. There's blood yeah, that, like, and ass uh, and innards all over the place. Uh, yeah. <laughs> look on the faces of the EMTs yeah. when they go in, they go, and see, this is the thing that got me is I kept screaming at the TV. Walk out and call the cops. Don't go in. Don't go <laughs> in. Don't open the door. Don't open the door. And the, and the way she put the thing up, the stethoscope, she goes, that moment, I just, I just, Oh, I was, fighting. I was licking my chops because my, my, uh, my horror senses were tingling. I knew what was about to happen. I knew what was behind that door and I'm like, open it, let it out. No. I wanted it. I, I wanted everybody to die at that point. So, yeah. Oh, it was really <laughs> hard. It was really hard to watch. <laughs> But, the, and you know, one of the things that jumps out at me also as I'm looking at this cast list is like you would think a movie like this, a, a, a relatively modest budget for today, didn't break $100 million to, total in box office, but, but still probably profitable in the end. Right. But then you've got somebody like Carrie Russell, who, are, who is a great veteran actress. You've got Alden Ehrenreich, who himself is a great actor who's probably in his prime right about now and hopefully will do more good things. O'Shea Jackson, who's very, very good. The late, great Ray, Ray Liotta, who was an absolute fucking goat. Uh, Margot Martindale, one of the great character actresses. Uh, you know, Jesse Tyler Ferguson, himself a big name in comedy and stuff like that. It's, God, he was such a nerd in this movie, though. Holy crap. Yeah, and then, and then Matthew Rice, who from the Americans, who plays uh, Carrie Russell's husband in the Americans. I mean, he himself a great actor as well. It's like there wasn't I mean, this is the kind of movie you would expect, like, you, you remember back in the day when Leprechaun was out, and that was the first big break? Oh, for, yeah. Uh, what's your name for uh, the girl from Jennifer Brandon, Anderson. Girl blank. Jennifer Anderson. Jennifer it's Anderson. It's like you would you yeah. would expect a movie like this to be one of those movies that you would do because you just want your career to start. But they went out and got right. these people who were absolute fucking bangers. They're great yeah. actors and actresses. Right. And it's like, and they signed on to do this. And you've got Elizabeth Banks, who she's had her ups and downs in her career, especially directing. But it's like, but I mean, this was a, this was a good effort on her part. I thought overall, I mean, yeah, some things. But I, I mean, I'm this glad wasn't a bad she, movie at all. This is the first movie that she's produced that she hasn't beat you over the head with feminism, and it's an actual good movie. I hope she remembers that going forward. I will say that because literally, you can't what if you're a man and you watch her version of Charlie's Angels, you just need to turn it off and go put your nose in the corner. Because that's pretty much what that movie really tells you. <laughs> it was bad. Uh, literally, that series, I mean, and that series oozes feminism that too. That was one of the, right. That's one of the. Well, no, well, no, no, see, that's the thing. The first two Charlie's Angels with Cameron Diaz and Lucy Liu and Drew Barrymore, those are great. The feminism oh, isn't. Okay. okay. It's fine. Well, it's fine because it's not a gender-driven beating you over the head nonsense. No. Go watch that newest one and tell me that's just I that's just not it. straight up. I you were talking about that one for a second. I was like, wait. Right. Well, that's what that's what I'm talking about. I said I'm talking about the newest one. The other ones with Cameron Diaz and all that. 
they're fun movies. They're they're the old show brought to life. The newest one that she directed. Sex potty and you know and have it not be. They didn't take themselves so seriously and preach to you that it ruins the movie. That's what the newest one does. So, like I said, going forward, I hope she remembers. Hey, we don't have to preach when we're here to entertain. You know what I'm saying? Right. So. But yeah, again, I, I thought it was a fantastic movie. I think it's a lot of fun. I hope you guys, if you haven't seen it yet, will go give it a chance. Like I said, turn your brain off, stuff your face full of popcorn, just enjoy the ride. This, yep. this movie is that that thrill ride roller coaster kind of thing. It's very little substance, or very little, very little substance. A whole lot of action, a whole lot of style, and uh, it's worth pretty it. It's, it's worth sitting there for. Pretty gamer says, "Sorry, I shot your friend. You're sorry." <laughs> <laughs> It also I'm is. We're not killing the dog today. <laughs> uh, also, if you haven't seen it, you don't have to go to the theater anymore. It's now streaming on uh, the Peacock. So and yep. I bought it on Amazon. By the way, you can buy it on Amazon now. And you can buy it on Amazon. That's probably how I'm going to end up going to get Pooh One Honey because I do want to get around to reviewing is it that. Available at some point there because I kind of want to watch it, maybe, but I don't want to. It's you can buy it or rent it on Amazon. I haven't found it on DVD anywhere yet because, to be absolutely honest, as much as I don't buy physical media anymore, I'd kind of like to have it on DVD. No, there's one. This is one I want to buy physically because there are deleted scenes. Apparently, there's a scene where. Uh, there's a cut in scene where they arrest Winnie the Pooh and we get to see Winnie the Pooh in a jail cell. I've wow. seen still images of it and I need to see this. I, I really yeah, enjoyed I, I heard something this. about that. I heard something about yeah. that. Like, uh, there's, there's, like the there's a scene where he's smoking a cigar and there's one where he's in jail. I don't know. There's there's a lot that they left off of or that, that got left on the cutting room floor that I need to see. So I'm going to be probably be picking that one up physically, yeah. Yeah, but uh, keep an eye out because we'll be talking about Pooh, Blood, and Honey as well. I, I, it is available for purchase or renting it on Amazon if you want to pay for it and not, oh. and not go get a physical copy. I kind of want to have a physical copy of it. Uh, Bruni Gamer says it's at Walmart. I'm going to have to cruise by Walmart here at some point in the near future and see about picking that up. kind of want to get it on Blu-ray. I think that'd be a lot of fun. So uh, you can expect us to be doing that later on too. But uh, thank you guys very much for coming hanging out with us. We very much appreciate it as we, as we broke down Cocaine Bear for you. One of, one of our most anticipated films of the year as we were breaking it down at the beginning of the year. This was on a lot of people's list. And uh, it did not disappoint, not the least bit. Again, you can go check it out on, uh, on the Peacock Network, uh, the streaming service they have for NBC. It is available on there for now. Also, I think it's, I think it's already also available on physical media for those of you who are still doing that kind of thing. But uh, thank you guys very much for coming out. I appreciate it. Uh, Lady Cora, where can the folks at home find you? On your show on Thursday night. Where you find it? How about you, Slash Division, down there in Texas? Where can the folks at home find you on your internet, my friend? Uh, Slash Division on Twitter. I just saw Evil Dead Rise. And holy crap, I can't wait to talk about that one. That's I, probably going to be our next review. I'm going to try to go see it on yeah. Wednesday. So hopefully in the next week Dude, and a half, yeah. we'll have a review after that. Yeah. I'm way behind a lot of movies right it's, now, but that's one of the ones yeah. I really, really want to see. So this is this is mommy's with the maggots now. Holy <laughs> crap! I've got thoughts. I can't wait. So don't forget to hit the like button on your way out, please. We would very much appreciate yeah. that. Also, if you share it around to your friends, we would appreciate that as well. We are still trying to. Uh, I haven't pressed it too much lately because it's been forgetting. We are trying to get to 500 subscribers. Once we do that, we will do the charity stream for the abandoned pet project all of the uh, donations we get will go to that wonderful charity when we get around to it we very much appreciate you guys coming around and hanging out with us as for me you can find me here every thursday talking about all the cool stuff happening in the world of tv streaming and uh, movies every thursday with my amazing crew uh this thursday don't forget will be a bit different text me probably a couple other people are going to be breaking down all of the first round of the NFL draft. So we'll be uh, we'll probably talking about a few movie things that come up. There is one big story that we can't really avoid talking about this week. For those of you who don't know, uh, apparently uh, Alec Baldwin's going to get away with it in the manner of speaking. But we'll probably talk about that yeah. later today as well after I've had a chance to read more about it. But, uh, but for the most part, it's all going to be about round one of the NFL draft. We're going to see who the Cowboys get, who the Niners could have gotten had they not traded away most of the first round for the next 100 years for Trey Lance. Uh, all the stuff going on in the first round, all the big trades that may or may not happen. We'll be talking about all that. And until next time, we'll see you guys then. Adios. Thanks for hanging out with us. See y'all later. Bye. I do cocaine. David Lee Roth.